provider. We have more than 10,000 beds across 75 hospitals with 8,000 clinicians in 55 specialties. We have Cradle. Namaste. Apollo Hospitals Group is India's largest integrated healthcare provider. We have more than 10,000 beds across 75 hospitals with 8,000 clinicians in 55 specialties. We have Cradle, a network of birthing centers, Spectra, a chain of daycare centers, Fertility, a network of IVF centers, 1300 plus diagnostic centers, a chain of dental clinics, a network of dialysis clinics, Sugar, a chain of clinics for pre-diabetes and diabetes. 260 plus primary clinics. India's largest pharmacy chain that will soon achieve the landmark of 5,000 pharmacies. Apollo MedSkills is the largest healthcare skilling institute in India. UR Life is our wellness platform. Family Health Plan Insurance is a TPA with a pan-India presence and a network of 14,000 plus healthcare providers. Medvasti is Asia's largest and fastest growing health edtech company having positively impacted the careers of 500,000 healthcare professionals across 192 countries. Leveraging nearly four decades of experience, we have designed Apollo Pro Health, a unique AI-enabled personalized health management program. Apollo Home Care has provided holistic care at home to 330,000 patients. Apollo Global Projects Consultancy has been engaged in 54 projects in 32 countries. Apollo Telehealth provides a spectrum of services breaking geographical barriers. Apollo Hospitals Education and Research Foundation, Apollo Research and Innovations and Apollo Knowledge administer state-of-the-art research and academic programs. For us, clinical excellence is a scholarly approach to clinical practice with passion passing on this mastery to the next generation of doctors and collaborating to enhance research. Our patient care stands on the three pillars of clinical, academic and research excellence. For us, clinical excellence is giving hope to Mahindra with Nemaline Rod disease who has seen the world upside down his entire life. Mahindra after corrective surgery. For us, Clinical Excellence is giving hope to this family with conjoint twins that Abriana and Adriana can lead independent lives. Abriana and Adriana after their separation with the founder and chairman of the Apollo Hospitals Group, Padm Vibhushan, Dr. Pratap Siredi. For us, Clinical Excellence is giving hope to the parents of Sanjay with liver failure that after a liver transplant, he will lead a normal life. Sanjay is the first child to have received a successful liver transplant in India at Apollo Hospital, Delhi in 1998. Sanjay had discharge. Sanjay, four years later. Sanjay, 10 years later. Sanjay, 15 years later, when the government of India issued a postage stamp marking 15 years of successful liver transplantation in India. 23 years later. Sanjay is now a doctor caring for patients at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. The highest rated hospitals are high volume institutions as best outcomes correlate with high procedure volumes. We have India's finest clinicians, hardwired system and processes developed over 39 years that ensure excellent outcomes. We have performed 200,000 heart surgeries, 300,000 angioplasties, minimal access cardiac surgeries, complex neonatal and pediatric cardiac surgery, structural heart interventions like DAVI and Mitra Clip are routinely performed. We've completed a million consults in patients with a malignancy, performed 3,000 bone marrow transplant, established 14 comprehensive cancer centers that provide radiation therapy, medical oncology, pediatric oncology, and oncosurgery, including robotic surgery. We have performed more than 370,000 orthopedic surgeries, including robotic joint replacements. Comprehensive subspecialty services are provided. More than 180,000 neurosurgeries have been performed. All subspecialty services are offered, including robotic spine surgery. From performing India's first successful pediatric and adult liver transplants, first successful combined liver and kidney transplant, more than 20,000 solid organ transplants have been performed. Kidney, liver, combined kidney, liver, heart, lung, combined heart, lung, pancreas, combined pancreas, kidney, and small bowel. 
Since 2012, every year more than 1,200 solid organ transplants have been performed. Even during the pandemic, 814 transplants were performed in 2020, and now every day, four transplants are performed. If any technology is available anywhere in the world, we brought it first to India because India deserves the best, be it cyber knife, robotics, or proton therapy. The Proton Therapy Center in Chennai is the only proton center in Southeast Asia. When COVID struck, we deployed a 360 degree approach and launched Project Quatch. The Quatch experience was published in the NAJM Catalyst. We treated more than 250,000 COVID patients, developed the capability to perform 10 confirmatory COVID tests per minute, participated in 25 clinical trials, and administered 5.5 million vaccines. We ensure that our patients are treated in a safe environment. A hospital in Delhi was the first in India and the sixth in Asia to get accredited by Joint Commission International. All our non-metro hospitals are accredited by NABH, the Indian accreditation body. What patients and clinicians want goes beyond credit. in India on PubMed. Our telemedicine network was inaugurated by President Clinton in 2000. From 12,500 feet in the Himalayas to a presence in 48 countries. From e-urban healthcare centers to tele-ophthalmology to digital dispensaries to an EICU program. To teleradiology through Apollo Radiology International providing radiological services across India and beyond to digital pathology linking pathologists across India covering 13 subspecialties of pathology. 13 million lives have been touched through Apollo Telehealth. Based on the learnings of 22 million health checks, ProHealth, the AI-enabled personalized health management program has shown impressive improvement in clinical parameters of individuals through personalized, proactive, and timely interventions. Apollo 24-7 is the fastest growing health care platform in India with over 17 million users across 450 cities. This new age end-to-end omni-channel platform offers a full bouquet of healthcare services, 24 into 7 consultation, seamless medicine delivery at home across 19,000 PIN codes, diagnostic test booking and doorstep sample collection 
digital health records and more. The Apollo Total Health Program in Haragonda and surrounding villages in the state of Andhra Pradesh for a population of 70,000 people encompassing physical, mental and social health, ecology, spiritual well-being and economic fulfillment is now a case study at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Many honors have come our way including two case studies from Harvard Business School International and National Awards and Recognition. The greatest honor is that four stamps have been issued marking our achievements. 25 years of service to the nation, 15 years of liver transplantation in India, performing 150,000 open heart surgeries and completing 20 million health checks. We are privileged to have earned the trust of 200 million individuals from 140 countries. Thank you. Welcome to Apollo Proton Cancer Center. Our approach to cancer management is attention by site-specific combined cancer management teams comprising radiation, surgical and medical oncologists. The team examines the patient and advises investigations. On completion of investigations, the details are reviewed by a multidisciplinary tumor board to decide whether the patient will benefit from proton therapy. Our team of physicists and clinicians conduct a pre-planning audit. Following this, the clinicians contour the target as well as the organs at risk and prescribe a treatment plan. The medical physics team then creates a proton therapy plan and often a rival tomo therapy plan for comparison. The ideal plan is selected and confirmed by the clinical and medical physics teams. This ideal plan is the one that administers the best possible dose to the tumor while ensuring that the dose to normal structures is restricted. An APCC accurately model, quality assured, and the protocol driven intensity modulated proton therapy is delivered to the suitable patients in three treatment modes using dedicated pencil group scanning users and the quad wave CT. Proton therapy improves local control and therefore outcomes in some situations. Reduces the toxicity of radiation in others and does both in many clinical situations. Tumors of the central nervous system are excellent indications for proton beam therapy, both in children and adults. Various aggressive benign brain tumors such as meningiomas, pituitary adenomas, cranios, especially located in challenging sites can benefit from proton therapy with or without surgery. Proton therapy is also particularly effective in almost all childhood brain tumors where the long-term cure rates are high and because it spares adjacent normal tissues, these patients are able to achieve significantly superior long-term quality of life than those treated with conventional radiation. Our experience in Apollo Proton Center in treating a fairly large number of patient population with CNS tumors has been quite encouraging. Most children with cancers, although have excellent long-term outcomes, are susceptible to various medical and social issues which can significantly affect their adult life. Among the various modalities and innovations used to address some of these is proton therapy, which is probably the most preferred treatment option for children, adolescents and young adults with cancerous and non-cancerous tumors that can be treated with radiation therapy. Prospective studies from several reputed centers across the world, including ours, have shown that by limiting the radiation exposure to healthy growing tissues, proton therapy leads to lesser probability of late effects such as hearing loss, neurocognitive impairment, hormonal disturbances, growth abnormalities, cardiac issues, reproductive failure, and several others, including lesser probability of second cancers. Head and neck cancers are the commonest cancer in India, and this is naturally our area of focus. In these cancers, proton therapy reduces the long-term and short-term consequences of treatment as compared to techniques like IGRT and IMRT. In the short term, we have noted that this means less risk of pain, of infection, of requiring a feeding tube, and a smaller risk of treatment interruption. And in the long run, this means a better chance of getting back to or preserving a normal life. Proton therapy has a special role in both the elderly as well as in young cancer patients in whom it reduces the risk of having a second cancer. 
proton therapy also has an important role to play in face of skull lesions such as adenoid cystic carcinomas, paranasal sinus tumors, and cordomas. In addition, we have noted a special role in post-operative oral cavity tumors, which are, of course, of special interest in this part of the world. Proton therapy treatments are closely supervised and patients are reviewed regularly. On completion of proton therapy, the patient is reviewed by the clinical team and counseled on post-treatment care. Um, I humbly stand before you today, having been given the honor of extending a warm welcome to you colleagues, not only in KZN, um, but also to, you know, what I think is going to be a very interesting presentation by Apollo. I stand here on behalf of the South African Medical Association. Um, actually, I feel out of order because we are accompanied by our CEO, or Mr. Vosin Shaku, who is here. Um, I am a board member um, as well, and um, I serve in that capacity in summer. But nevertheless, I've been asked to warmly introduce you guys and welcome you. Colleagues, um, when I was asked to do this welcome, and I was told that we would be discussing um, this proton beam therapy, I, I thought it was interesting. I actually had just been invited, I think about three weeks back, to do a cancer talk um, with some you know, um, people from different areas and sectors, but we were discussing more cervical cancer. So I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting, let's see. Something else that interested me was that this is also coming from India. And I say that given the economic background of South Africa and India, in that we are almost comparable in terms of our population, in terms of our economy, so you can almost draw inferences. I, I however, then decided to go and just look up on the page to try and find out exactly what is going on here. I was impressed when I heard that it's only been 37 years that you guys are celebrating, and this initially started with cardiology. I think the, the, the screen has sort of spoiled this. It initially started with cardiology, which then led into Apollo going into the field of oncology. A young 37 years, I was impressed if you're looking at what is apparently done. I further went on to hear that they've got 14 centers with more than 1,000 beds, more than 200 oncologists. And I started asking with the wait, what is not going right in South Africa? <laughs> we, we can't even claim one oncology center in South Africa. So I think for us this is going to be not only a great learning experience, but also one to see what we can do and do better for our oncology patients. So that, it, it interested me to say that how then can a country with a similar economy and background and in such a short time frame have a group and collective that have gone so far in advancing for treatment. One of the things that also um, drew me when I was reading this background was the focus on early diagnosis because we know that South Africa has also taken the primary health care approach. So early diagnosis, we know, plays a very important part in cancer. Beyond that, also the personalized approach. I think we've all seen, if you, you've worked at a floor level, the disparity that patients have that actually makes them decide, I will no longer be taking treatment. We do not understand the side effects that they must be suffering and how unbearable it must be for a patient to actually get to a point where they say, I would rather face death than continue with my cancer treatment. So that part, actually, it spoke to me, the personalized, and it's, it's also multidisciplinary. That I also liked because we all come to know that 
cancer is no longer just about a surgeon. It needs to involve everybody. It's your pathologist, it's your nuclear medicine, it's your rehab, it's everybody, your radiographer, it's, it's even pediatrics. It's a whole team that needs to get together, let alone the psychology of the patient as well that needs to be attended to when treating. So this multidisciplinary team approach also is something that I think is notable and I think is something that we probably can learn from. I am not going to go into the science of it. I think there's people that are far more learned and have you know, better grants to actually come and educate us on proton therapy about what it does in preservation of normal tissue versus the others, how the toxicity background is much better, side effect profile is better. But for me, colleagues, I, I would like to say welcome and I'm really hoping that we are going to learn a lot about how to set up a health system, how you are managing and actually making a difference in cancer. In KZN, I mean, we're coming from the oncology crisis, if you know the background of KZN, where Sama was at the forefront of demanding the rights of patients to the level of going to the Human Rights Council. So it is something close to our hearts, and finding a space for it in a country with the same economic background and also heading towards NHI, I think gives us great hope and I think we've got a lot to learn. So colleagues, I think it's going to be a very interesting um, talk and I look forward to it. Afternoon, colleagues. Thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful event. Before I start, I'd like to greet everybody. Greet the CEO, Dr. Nsako, the CEO of, C of uh, SAMA, and greet the leadership as well of uh, SAMA and our colleagues from India. Thank you for coming and sharing your information with us, and I welcome you all and all the colleagues in the medical field. My name is Basil Enika. I'm from the Department of Neurosurgery at Ngozi uh, Abelutuli. Um, and you visit Wazulu Natal, and I've been tasked today to give you an overview of brain tumors. It's quite a very big topic, so I'll try to just give you a brief overview and summary of this very magnificent uh, 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 topic. When you look at the epidemiology of uh, CNS tumors, it varies internationally. As you can see in this uh, figure here that is uh, up on the screen, uh, the incidence is varies according to geographical variation. In Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, the incidence is sitting right there between 1.3, uh, uh, that's approximately 1.3 per 100,000 population, but there's not a lot of data really emanating from Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, CNS tumors, with a lot of data emanating either from uh, uh, North America, Europe, and, uh, and Asia as well, you know. Uh, if you look at the pictures, well, some of the countries there in the north seem to have the highest incidence of uh, CNS tumors. When you look at the global, uh, uh, the age incidence of this of CNS tumors, as you can appreciate here, as the age increases, the incidence also increases with a peak round about middle age, and with males more affected uh, 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 than females. And if you look again at the incidence in the group it according to age, uh, 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 adults are more affected than children, and as the age increases as well, the more malignant uh, uh, the tumors become.
Brain tumors, if you understand brain tumors, it's all about location, 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 right? It's like real estate, you know? It's, sometimes it's not about the house that you buy, it's about where you buy the house. So it's a, if you look at brain tumors, I think that's the most important thing. And, and, and as you can see, the brain is divided into different regions, which are called lobes from the frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital lobe, the cerebellum, the brain stem, uh, which then continues to be the upper cervical cord. As you can see in this diagram, the frontal lobe is the commonly affected area when it comes to brain tumors, and most of the symptoms are related to the region of the brain that is affected. If you look at the distribution of malignant brain tumor, especially primary brain tumors, as in the picture that I've shown previous, the frontal lobe is a commonly affected area, and, and if you look at the distribution of these of, of this malignant brain tumors, the glioblastomas are one of the most commonest uh, brain tumors, malignant brain tumors seen in other population, and they can be problematic brain tumors uh, to treat with a poor survival rate. If you look at children, distribution in children, again, uh, 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 the cerebellum seems to be, the, in the posterior force, uh, seems to be the most commonly affected area of the brain. And with polycytic astrocytoma, which is a benign tumor, being amongst the commonest tumor that you see in children. In, ades in adolescents as well, if you look at tumors in adolescents and young adults, the pituitary tumors and meningiomas, they swell, and then in this age group, these type of tumors start to increase. And again, you know, uh, 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 and the side varies really when you look at, uh, at adults and uh, 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 young adults and adolescents with tumors commonly coming from the meninges and areas that are outside of the, uh, 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 of the brain tissue as such. Again, I just put in the slide to labor the point and to make, to put, to complete the whole picture. As you can see in, in elderly patients, meningiomas which have different grades tend to increase in size going on to patients that are above the age of 70. Uh, 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 while in children, uh, the young children tend to have gliomas, but as the age increases, you know, other tumors such as the tumors of the pituitary region, the polycystic astrocytomas will decrease in size. As we know, this is a tumor associated with childhood, but other tumors as, as the children age into adolescence start to come into form. When you're looking at the literature and systematic reviews of, uh, uh, of brain tumors, uh, as I've said initially in the beginning of my talk, most of the data will come from North America and, um, and, uh, and, and, and Europe. But I found this uh, a nice systemic review as well that was looking at uh, 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 the distribution of CNS tumors in Sub-Saharan Africa. And they look at many papers that have been published. Unfortunately, uh, uh, a, a paper, uh, when I looked at this, there was not a paper uh, from South Africa that was quoted in the series, but suffice to say that many Jomas in Africa, when you, from 1960 and, and 2017, I mean, most of the tumors that were reported was many Jomas. As you can see, this is commonly the tumor of, the, of, of, of adults, and then astrocytomas as well uh, are, are some of the most commonly uh, 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 presented tumor tumors in the sub-Saharan African population. What is more important again is that the survival, survival declines with age. You see here in young adults, in, in children and young adults, the survival tends to be good, but as people grow older and you get more complex and more tumors, the survival decreases. So let's look down now into uh, KwaZulu Natal uh, in South Africa. I mean, I work at Inkose Avenue 2, which is a continuary uh, central hospital, which is the sole referral unit for neurosurgery patients in the province, treating, as you know, the population of Kazuri Natal is approximately 12 million now. So we see a lot of uh, CNS tumors that get referred to us from all institutions across the province. The majority of these tumors are from uh, adults, 73% and the rest are, 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 are pediatric patients. If you look at the CNS adult tumors, if you look at the distribution of other the, the commonest, the, the commonest tumors will be uh, uh, meningiomas uh, and, and followed by pituitary adenomas. Those are the commonest tumors that we see. And if you look at children as well, gliomas, uh, 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 craniopharyngiomas, and so forth, these are the commonest tumors. This is in percentages. These are the commonest tumors that we see in, in children. And there was this paper 
that looked at the MRI characteristics of intracranial masses in AZN. Again, this was over a six-year period in children, and again, as you can see, craniopharyngiomas were one of the most commonest tumors followed by low-grade gliomas, as you see in keeping as well, which what some of the units will see in other centers, and medulloblastomas as well are one of, one of the commonest malignant tumors in children seen in, in, in the province of Wazulu Natal. And often these tumors will present the most commonest symptoms that they will present are seizures and headache. So, so suffice to say, and if a child presents with seizures, especially repeated seizures, it should be appropriately investigated and then referred appropriately because some of most often, or maybe let me, let me not say often, but, you, but uh, what you can find is that there's an intracranial lesion as a source of these of, of the seizures and that might need to be treated urgently. How do you classify brain tumors? You know, tumors can either arise from intrinsic areas of the brain, the extrinsic area. The extrinsic areas will be from the skin if the tumor arises from the skin, such as squamous cell carcinoma, they invade the bone and invade into the brain. Extrinsic, uh, it can arise from the bone as well. You've got these bony tumors that can invade uh, the dura and invade into the, into, into, the, into the brain. And then mainly from the meninges, meningiomas, which is the commonest tumors that I've mentioned that we see in locally and also internationally arises from the meninges of the brain and then extrinsically push into the brain. Then you get these intrinsic tumors, these are glial tumors that will arise from any of the cells, you know, the neurons, the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes. And some of the ependema, ependema, which is the lining of the ventricle, you can get these tumors that arise from there that will blockage, that will block the CSF pathways and cause obstructive hydrocephalus. Other tumors, of course, will arise from the pituitary gland, which plays a major role uh, in the body because it secretes a lot of human uh, of hormones that are vital for functioning of the of the human body and 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 often these tumors as well if they get large enough will will will, 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 will cause mass effect and compress vital neurocritical structures this is quite a busy slide but essentially what it tries to explain is the who recent who grade classification of brain tumors uh, this is quite exhaustive but suffice to say is that with this classification, the emphasis has been on molecular molecular studies, how to molecular subtype uh, 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 brain tumors, because that has pro that has prognostic values. And most labs, uh, uh, locally and internationally, uh, offer this type of uh, of uh, molecular studies, because in this they guide the oncologists as to, as to which tumors, especially, will respond to adjuvant therapy, chemo, especially chemotherapy. If you look at the classification, just a broad overview of gliomas, because these are some of the most important tumors. This is where now the molecular psychogenetics, which is quite important where it comes in, because the tumor can be yeah, referred as a grade two, but if it's like an IDH wild type, you know, you know, you know, it's different from an IDH mutant, and that can affect the prognosis of patients. That's all we know is what the glioblastoma, which is a malignant tumor, which is a dismal prognosis with a short survival after diagnosis of the tumor. There are some familial syndromes uh, which are associated with CNS tumors. More importantly, the neuroprobomatosis, these two syndromes, which is NF1, NF2, and these are some of the gene, uh, 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 genetic abnormalities associated with that, uh, uh, which, which are the result, which cause these, uh, these tumors. And often, they'll present the tumors such as neurofibromas, meningiomas, schwannomas, especially natural schwannomas, tuberous sclerosis, commonly will be seen in children present with SEGA, which is subepidermal giant cell astrocytomas. These are intraventricular tumors that will present with obstructive uh, hydrocephalus and so forth. So, so, so there are some syndromic genetic abnormalities that are associated with brain tumors. Some tumors as well, majority of brain tumors are sporadic. They develop for whatever reason without a, without a known cause, but we know that there are some genetic abnormalities syndromes that are associated with these tumors. For example, this is a typical case of neuroprobromatosis uh, type 2. You can see the patient is bilateral vestibular schwannomas. This tumor usually will go from the, from the vestibular division of the, of the, of the eighth nerve, and the patient will present with deafness. And, this, is, uh, and this, this condition can be very debilitating because these patients can present with tumors elsewhere. This is a typical case. You can see it's a neuroprobromatosis. There's a mass lesion. Uh, uh, here uh, uh, on the surface, uh, uh, on the face, uh, and here in the spine as well, there's a tumor that is developed there from the, uh, uh, from the nerve roots, and some of the tumors can develop from the meninges as well, 
and this is a patient with multiple tumors uh, in keeping with the neuropropomatosis. With neuropropomatosis type 1, some of these patients can have optic pathway gliomas and present with blindness and proptosis as the tumor increases in size, and these are often very difficult tumors to treat. This again is, an, is a patient with neuropropomatosis. You can see these multiple tumors that develop an, uh, 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 along the nerve sheets, and this can be very disfiguring and debilitating for patients. And they present with multiple meningiomas, these are drug based tumors uh, in a patient with neuropropomatosis. So, usually, then, uh, when we treat these patients, we treat the largest, the one that's most symptomatic, and we often will stage uh, in neurosurgical treatment, surgical treatment of this patient. And these are intra uh, uh, spinal, these are spinal cord tumors, these are appendonomas, because often as well, these patients are present with spinal cord tumors, intramedullary tumors. And as I said before, I mean, this is a typical example of a patient, especially children, that presents with, uh, with uh, syndromic or familial uh, 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 tumors. Uh, as you can see, some of these, I think, is most familiar to everybody, this port wine stain. Uh, patients with tuberous sclerosis, they'll have teeth problems, uh, 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 a lot of skin issues, which are diagnostic of, tuber, uh, uh, of, of tuberous sclerosis, which I'm not going to spend time on. That's just an overview of the syndromic, syn syndromic uh, diseases that are associated with, uh, with brain tumors. So, so this is where we come in as neurosurgeons or as medical practitioners because it's often these patients will become symptomatic and the symptoms will depend on where the tumor is. Often if it's the cerebellum, the patient in cerebellum, patients will present with ataxia, gait disturbances, and so forth and so forth. And the worst place or some of the worst places where these tumors can arise is in the brainstem or compressing the brainstem because then can cause cranial nerve pulses. Uh, 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 which can range from the seven nerve to lower cranial nerves, uh, gait disturbances as well, seizures if it's in the if, it, if, if the tumor arises from the supracellular area. I mean, often as, as in the previous slides, if you see the frontal lobe, patients will present with these cognitive uh, 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 problems, uh, 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 language problems, uh, and the temporal area as well, if the tumor arises there, those, those patients as well can have. Uh, uh, speech problems, seizures as well can be uh, 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 most prominent symptom of temporal lobe uh, 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 lesions, motor weakness if it arises from the motor area, visual disturbances if it arises from the primary visual cortex. And often, I always say, often if you look at in patients as well, often get labeled as psychiatric patients and often you find that they have this type of tumor.
frontal forcing, enlargement of the frontal air sinuses, prognathism, uh, because the jaw becomes larger, and the tongue, microglossy, and the tongue become a problem, and they have large adenoids, and they have problems with snoring, sleeping, uh, 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 carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal, spinal back pain because of spinal stenosis, uh, because of this endocrine access. So this is just some of the things to look out for when you're assessing a patient with a brain tumor. MRI is the gold standard, and I think there's radiologists amongst us in the, in the crowd here who will, testify, who, will, who will testify to the fact that the, the MRI gives you a superior view of the tumor and the neurovascular and surrounding structure. And how these tumor, tumors cause problems mainly with the third nerve dilated uh, uh, pupil and then you can get downward cerebral tonsillar like herniation and that can lead into into death with this compression of the upper cervical of the brain stem. Again one of the symptoms that we treat as neurosurgeons of tumors is hydrocephalus. Uh, hydrocephalus is quite a very important uh, uh, complication of tumors and this is a typical patient is that a third ventricular tumor causing obstructive hydrocephalus and some of the hypocephalus can occur by blockage as well. In the fourth ventricle, this is typically a patient, a child with a, with a medulloblastoma or could be appendomoma that causes obstructive hydrocephalus. Uh, as depicted in this picture, you can see the ventricles are quite large, there's running of the third ventricle, and this becomes a neurosurgical emergency. And often will treat that with endoscopy, third ventric, endoscopic third ventricular stomach and bypass the obstruction. Uh, at the level of the fourth ventricle if the, if, if the tumor arises there or by shunting or another simple way is just to remove the tumor. Treatment options include uh, 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 ob obviously observation, biopsy, surgical resection, chemotherapy, radiation, and often now, you know, with precision medicine, uh, uh, the patient will often receive tailored multimodal therapy. And I think probably this is what our colleagues from Apollo are gonna expand on. And the goals of surgery, obviously, is always as a neurosurgeon, the goal is to provide diagnosis, because it's important, because if you know what tumor you're treating, then you can give appropriate uh, uh, adjuvant therapy, relieve symptomatic mass effect, uh, 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 and sometimes as well, surgery can be used to deliver therapy, and also to prolong survival through cytor, through cytor reduction, because this is our main function, is to prolong life and improve quality of life. One of the commonest tumors that we see uh, is a low-grade gliomas. These tumors are challenging. They present with seizures. It's a typical one that we treated the Avalu tool. Uh, this is a, a, a low-grade glioma. Uh, uh, it's a hypo, hypo, uh, hypo intense. It doesn't enhance very well on contrast. It's in the temporal lobe, and the patient will present with seizures. And often, the prognostic factors for these tumors, gliomas, would be age. It's quite important. But most of these other, most of these prognostic factors that I've listed here, you can't really change except for surgery, how you operate and how much tumor you take out. But if you leave no residual tumor, small residual tumor, uh, that's how you improve the outcome of patients. Things like the KPS comorbidities, 
that are an epilepsy, usually those things are out uh, of control of the treating physicians. It's how, just how the patient presents to you. The neurosurgical strategies that we use, obviously, to, to optimize resection of these tumors, one of that is available to us as neurosurgeons is, 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 a, is a microscope. It is a critical tool that is used by neurosurgeons in order to improve cytoreduction reduction of tumors. Uh, uh, neural navigation, these are all the tools that we have at Inkose Avalu to navigation because this as, as well localizes the tumor very well. It's like a, it's like a, a, a navigation, you know, if, if you're using a car where you put in your coordinates, then the car tells you where to go. Navigation works the same way. You put in the coordinates to tell you exactly where the tumor is so that you can do precision surgery and you can put your cranial tumor where, the, where exactly the tumor is so that you can increase and improve cyto reduction. 5L as well is quite important, you know, because uh, uh, it improves. Because once you take out the tumor, you know, sometimes it can be very different, difficult to differentiate between the tumor and the brain. And as you can see, this pink area after the patient is taking this 5L, you can see after cyto reduction, there's still residual tumor. And it helps you as well improve cyto reduction of the tumor. Right? A cranial ultrasound is quite important. It's a very cheap and useful tool that one can use intraoperatively to help you, to help you improve the section of brain tumors. And functional MRI, you know, often, you know, some of the patients, like the patient that I showed, this tumor is developing eloquent area, such as speech area, motor area, and functional MRI is very quite important in order to highlight the functional areas. You can see here, this patient is talking, uh, 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 but we expect we expect the speech area to be in focus area because we know that's where the primary focus is. But as the patient is speaking, you can see these other areas are highlighting as well, uh, 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 which, which tells you that there's other speech areas that are activated in this patient. If you look at them, another important uh, is the DTI where you look at the fiber tracts, uh, 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 where you can then see where the important tracts are that will help you minimize and improve surgical resection. Uh, without giving patient neurological deficit. And the cues uh, 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 is what we, what we normally use routinely will help us to resect tumors. This is a typical uh, cavity that is left after resection of a tumor with the aid of, of, of this instrument. I think it's quite important and plays a very important role in the excision of tumors. Our craniotomies for patient, a lot of routine been written about our craniotomies this is used for patients that have tumors in the eloquent area where you do cortical mapping. You can map up the speech area, like that patient that I, that I showed you the scan of with the, with the astrocytomas in an eloquent area on the left hand side of the brain in the speech area. So typically you want to do the patient awake and you want to map up the speech area and as soon as you operate in the stimulated area, the patient will have a speech arrest. That's how you know uh, uh, that you know this is this is area that you should avoid. And, and as you are mapping up the motor and the speech area, you map up this so that you know and, and use this number so that you know which are the important areas and these are the areas you avoid so that you can do maximal resection. Intraoperative MRI helps in improving the uh, resection of brain tumors. However, we don't have this. Some centers uh, uh, have this routine, use this routine, the upper tool we don't have use of intraoperative MRI. These are some of the, I think, cases as well that typically uh, would be referred for, uh, 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 for radiation as well if there's invasion of the cavernous sinus. This is a, 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 a tuberculum cell meningioma. It's affecting, you can see there's a gyral tail. This patient is present with visual uh, abnormalities because again, it's about real estate. There's a lot of important structures that are here. The optic cars and the optic nerve is in this area. The pituitary gland is there. So you, you always try and preserve this area. And some patients can present with pituitary adenomas. Here you can see the pituitary gland is all invaded by tumor. These tumors fall out into the spinal sinus. And often some of these tumors will outgrow their blood supply and then present with what is called pituitary apoplexy with this hemorrhage within the, within the cavity of the tumor, which becomes an emergency. The endoscope has revolutionized how we treat these tumors, especially how we approach the anterior skull phase, because it's minimally invasive. With the endoscope through the nose, you can reach a lot of areas in the anterior skull phase, the, the tuberculum cellar area, the spinal sinus, all the way down to the clivus, if you're dealing with uh, tumors such as cardomas. Uh, and we routinely make use of that instrument, that Albert Uh This is just an interesting case as well that we treated recently. This is 
uh, 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 often this is a, an epid this is a demo assist that is ruptured into 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 uh, into the ventricle in this patient presented with chemical uh, meningitis to take in this and reset that and uh, and uh, 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 and obviously this patient still has hydrocephalus and probably will need uh, further uh, treatment. CNS lymphomas often these these tumors are, are, are seen in patients that are HIV positive. We get these high grade B cell lymphomas and and and, and with palsy and radical resection as, as shown in this case is a typical. They can present typically or atypically. This, if you look at face value, this looks like a meningioma. I think a radiologist here would say probably this is a meningioma. It looks like maybe this is a dual tail here. But this actually came back as a, an informer in, a, in an HIV positive patient. And this patient usually will respond very well uh, to chemotherapy and, uh, and, and ARV therapy as well. Metastases are quite important because they are one of with the aging population as well in in in, 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 uh, in South Africa. We're we seeing a lot of brain metastases, uh, 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 and, and often in patients that are elderly, they present with a posterior fossa uh, uh, lesion. You always have to think as one of your differentials is uh, uh, metastasis number two, metastasis number three, metastasis, and how we approach this patient will depend on the number uh, on the KP. Uh, on the performance function of the of the patient, the number of metastases that the patient has, and whether the source control of this disease, uh, of the primary disease, and often again, these patients will present with hydrocephalus in this is a lesion in the post force of compressing the fourth ventricle, and then you have to address the hydrocephalus and then decide how you manage this patient further. In patients as well with metastases, often as well, we refer those as well for 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 for, 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 for radiotherapy. And patient with leptomeningeal diseases, a patient with metastasis, with the disease with, with cancer that is spread through the leptomeninges that can spread all the way down to the spine. And often this is associated with poor prognosis. All of this enhancement that you see in this patient is all of this is just cancer. Uh, and often with biopsy this and we give the histology and refer to the oncologist for further treatment. Medalloplastomas, pediatric tumors in the posterior fossas, medalloplastomas, ependymomas, is a quite common tumors that we'll see in children. And the aim of treatment, again, they present with hydrocephalus and need to be addressed. The aim of the treatment is complete cytal reduction and then referral to the oncologist for further treatment. And you also always have to do MRI of the spine to exclude drug metastasis. This is the commonest tumor that we see in children. Polycystic astrocytoma it presents with the large cystic lesion and the, and the mural nodule. And often these tumors are very they are, are very uh, easy to resect and it's very easy to, comp to achieve complete resection. Uh, we don't often, we don't prefer these kids for, for, for any adjuvant therapy because the treatment here is complete resection and, and then to observe the patient and follow up with settlements MRI. Craniopharyngiomas are one of the most difficult tumors to, to treat uh, in children. As you can see here, they, they, they grow and affect, they cause vision because the optic pathways are here. They affect the hypothalamus. Patients will present the hypothalamic syndrome. They're quite large. Perforators go through this. If you, sometimes they're trying to be aggressive. Patients have hypothalamic injuries uh, because of the perforators. And they sometimes, like in this case, is a very large with the cystic lesion. So, so there's many ways to treat this, you know, purely solid lesion can uh, 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 achieve complete resection with the large cystic component. Obviously, uh, I mean, you can put, you put things such as an OMAR reservoir into the cyst and drain the cyst, give the patient uh, a, 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 a adjuvant uh, radiation. And then pineal region tumors are, 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 are quite important. In radiation and adjuvant therapy. Trinomas are, 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 
uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, they developed from the vestibular division of the eighth nerve. These are the tumors of the less than three centimeters in size. Often in our practice, we refer them for radiation, for stereotactic radiotherapy. If they're larger in size, you know, because now they're compressing the brain stem, and then we'll aim for such a reduction after proper investigation uh, of, of this patient, making sure that the patient has preserved or abnormal hearing. And when we operate in these patients, because the seven, eight nerve and the seven nerve in close proximity, we do that with special monitoring in theater. If there's residual tumor that is left out of resection, these are the type of cases as well that we refer to the oncologist for uh, 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 radiation. Uh, uh, so we work hand in hand with the oncologist at Apple Tooley. I took this picture when during one of my clinics. This is our radiotherapy machine there that we use for, for some of the patients. I hope it's, 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 it's still there because I took this picture two years ago. Uh, but we, we work hand in hand, maybe they've got a new one. <laughs> yeah, but we work hand in hand with them and we often refer patients, appropriate patients for, 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 for appropriate treatment in a multidisciplinary forum as shown in the videos before. And all of this work is done by a very young and energetic team in neurosurgery for above and beyond the call of duty to make sure that the outcomes of patients with the neurosurgical conditions are improved in the province of Wazulan South. And with that, I thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been asked to do a proper introduction to Dr. Srinivas Chilukuri. Excuse me if I'm messing up the name. He is a senior consultant from Apollo, and he is um, specializing in radiation oncology, uh, mostly pediatric and thoracic cancers. He is a skilled and accomplished radiation oncologist, and as I've said, he's a highly sought after speaker in various oncology forums. He has several firsts to his credit. He was one of the first radiation oncologists in the Southeast Asia to develop expertise and experience in volumetric modulated arc therapy technique for pediatric and prostate cancers. Those are the two of his areas of expertise as well as thoracic cancer. He has been the clinical lead for advanced radiation therapy school and has trained more than 200 radiation oncologists from the Indian subcontinent. He has received training in proton therapy from top proton centers of the world like the Mayo Clinic, the Miami Cancer Institute, and the University of Maryland Proton Center. He graduated with the, at, at an Armed Forces Medical College um, after securing all in the rank six, six, which is some level of um, achievement in terms of entry level to, um, to go to university. He's got an MD in radiation um, oncology at the Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai. He obtained that in 2004, where he completed his training with the university top rank under the supervision of the legendary Dr. Keta Jung Dinsho. He joined the Yashoda Center Institute in June 2008 as a full-time consultant, to which he has been associated till March 2018. He's done several publications and, and received many awards, um, 30 publications in high-impact um, international journals, um, he has been a regular in various national and international meetings as an invited faculty. Among the several awards in 2013, he has received the American Society of Clinical Oncology Award for being amongst the most promising young oncologists for that year at their annual meeting in Chicago in the US. Successfully, he has organized a national level meeting of Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology at Hyderabad 
with more than 400 delegates. The meeting received rave reviews from academic format and for academic format and content. He has been part of a select ICMR panel consisting of 10 oncologists and have formulated national guidelines on the management of gastric cancer. So besides pediatric, besides um, thoracic um, cancer, besides prostate cancer, he has actually gone into gastric cancers as well. Please welcome Dr. Srinivas Chilukori. मुझे और बंसरी को ट्रैवल करना बहुत पसंद है। In fact, it was our yearning for wanderlust that brought us together. The day I held her hand, I knew यही मेरी सोलमेट है। The first promise we made was हम हर सफर में एक दूसरे का साथ देंगे। But Zendiki Achanak Rup Sikai. And life seemed to have different plans for us. I was detected with a very rare brain tumor. Ik palkili lagaja se, life will not be the same again. But Bansari ne har ni mani. She was determined we win over this together. That's when we discovered Apollo Proton Cancer Center. Proton beam therapy se, kuch hi dino mein I started feeling the difference. Now, I'm leading life to the fullest with my soulmate. Thanks to this technology. Aaj mere paas uske liye ek surprise hai. To renew our wanderlust and walk with her once again, hand in hand. Very good evening and uh, welcome to this symposium. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Durban. I'm coming to Durban for the first time. I've been to Cape Town before, but this is my first time in Durban and um, I really like what I already see and uh, have landed in the morning today. Extremely picturesque, very similar to where I live in Chennai. Of course, it's far more beautiful than Chennai, but um, you know, I, I really liked uh, a Durban, but I'm not here to talk about Durban and South Africa. You're already living here. Lucky guys. But um, I will be talking about a technology which is called proton beam therapy to uh, all of you and introducing what it is. And um, we have been using this technology for last four years plus on January 2nd of 2019. We were the, one of the first hospitals in the entire region, Southeast Asian region, to start this uh, therapy in India. May I know um, how many of you are oncologists or is there any oncologists? Wait. Very, very, I'm very uh, glad that both of you are here. Um, um, so let me start by saying this is our center. It's about 130 bedded hospital located in Chennai. Um, and we, I would obviously love any of you to come and visit Chennai and visit our center. So I took a flight from Chennai, which obviously uh, it took, takes about 14 hours, but I don't have a direct flight. So I had to fly through Ethiopia which took me longer than 14 hours, 45 minutes, probably around 17 hours. So a bit, long, bit of a long flight, but not too long. And on these days, distances are, they don't matter much because we are easily able to travel. 
India, I know, I don't know whether some of, I'm sure some of you have visited India and India is famous for many things. Um, these are some of the things, the food, the culture, the attire, you know, the festivals and everything else. It's extremely, and so I, I wish some of you, uh, and I hope some of you will come to India to visit uh, India in general, but of course, visit our center as well. Now, coming to the cancer, which is the primary uh, uh, topic of today, I found out that uh, with a population of about 59 million in South Africa, the new cancer cases in a year are approximately 108,000. India's population is nearly 23 times the South Africa. It's about 1.3 billion. The number of cancer cases is approximately uh, 12, 13 times compared to 100,000. We have 1.3 million new cancer cases every year. Number of deaths is about 12, 13 times. Uh, so this is how the, you know, there are many, many similarities in terms of what kind of cancers we see in India and what you all see in South Africa, at least among males, of course, the prostate is the biggest, you know, you can see the 25%, according to the Global Can 2018, are prostate cancers. Lung cancers, colorectal seem to be a kind of a similar kind of a, uh, percentages in India and South Africa. Kaposi sarcoma, of course, uh, has, has been uh, one of the commonest uh, tumors in South Africa and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we have a slightly different set of cancers among men, but at least among the top five cancers. But if you see among the women, the breast and cervix seem very, very identical. Of course, colorectal and of course, ours, India is probably the capital of oral cavity and head and neck cancers because there is a lot of tobacco chewing which happens in India and that is why we see a lot of oral cavity cancers. So, you know, Dr. Dr. Uh, Bikisha mentioned very nicely that India and South Africa are in the same similar dem demographic and we fall in the medium human development index and I think South Africa seems to be slightly higher than India in terms of human development index. But you can see that there is significant increase. You're going to see a significant increase in cancer cases in the next 15, 20 years. And obviously we need to do something about it. And you know, this is just a small drop in that ocean of that effort, which all of us have to put in. And um, she also mentioned about precision oncology, personalized medicine. And there are many, many tenets to it, many, many ways. The treatment is getting more and more personal. But I think the most important reason why we are going towards the goal of precision oncology is the pathology and imaging. I think these two are key pillars on which the entire precision oncology is based on. And of course, there are many, many high tech, high tech gadgets which are helping us to achieve uh, this dream of precision oncology or really personalized medicine. We are using genomics right now targeted therapies, immunotherapies, quite routinely for majority of cases, of course, the depth of understanding is getting better and better. And we are uh, moving towards, uh, um, you know, much higher, much you know, patient level uh, genomics. We're also looking at um, robotic surgery, which is being done routinely, uh, and robotic site specific oncology is happening routinely. Uh, 3D printing is enabling very complex reconstructive surgeries. Radiation therapy is also advancing quite a bit. We have high precision radiation therapy, which is kind of now established all over the world. Image guided radiation and high precision radiation therapy, but particle beam therapy is maybe an emerging uh, uh, kind of treatment. Uh, MRI guided therapy is also another emerging technology, which is, you know, uh, impacting the oncology and especially towards precision oncology. But there are many in pipeline too, and, and I'm not here to discuss all those, but essentially there is a lot of hope and we, we hopefully we will be able to be, uh, you know, achieve better results, better outcomes in the next few years. Um, I'm a radiation oncologist. I'm a professor in, uh, 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 in radiation oncology at Apollo Proton Cancer Center. 
And as a radiation oncologist um, to non-oncologists, radiation therapy is used in approximately 60-65% of cancer patients at some point, right? They, it can be used for curative treatments to achieve cure, whether you do it in, in, uh, in a setting where there is tumor, which is not resectable or only partially resectable. Uh, the neurosurgeon, Dr. Eniker, showed beautifully some of those indications of radiation, but sometimes the neurosurgeons are able to resect only a little bit of it because we mentioned uh, real estate is, you know, extremely difficult. I mean, in, in a difficult location, the tumors are, you know, cannot be resected completely. Sometimes we only do biopsies and then, you know, radiation comes. Not just intracranial indications, but extracranial indications too. We do routinely irradiate tumors when we see large intact tumors. We do irradiation in the post-operative setting when the tumor has been resected, but there is still some microscopic disease present. We do radiate patients who have advanced diseases where we palliate uh, symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. So radiation therapy is used approximately about 60, 65%. Sometimes in lower and middle income countries where we see more and more advanced cancers, literally two thirds of patients, almost two thirds of patients receive radiation therapy at some point of the time. So radiation therapy, just for non-radiation oncologists, very, very briefly, if this horseshoe shaped thing is the tumor and the spherical structure is the normal tissue, hypothetically, the two dimensional radiation was the time when we used to irradiate the horseshoe shaped tumors as well as the normal structures uniformly. That means we were not able to differentiate or differentially treat the tumor and normal tissues. But with 3D conformal radiation and intensity modulated radiation, we are able to treat tumors and normal tissues differentially. And having said that, there is still some amount of tu uh, normal tissues are still receiving some doses, maybe low doses, maybe intermediate doses, but some doses are being received by normal tissues. Now, in this context, let me introduce to you another completely different type of treatment, which is called proton beam therapy. So protons, unlike X-rays, X-rays enter a medium, enter a, say, for example, into the body. They deposit maximum energy within a few millimeters below the skin and then get attenuated. Attenuated means the intensity of X-rays comes down as the X-ray beam travels inside the body. Unlike X-rays, protons deposit some energy beneath the skin, but deposit their entire energy after traveling a certain distance called range of protons. So this is the range. If you, for example, this is 25 centimeter is a range exactly at 25 centimeters it deposits its entire energy and literally drops dead there is no attenuation there is as essentially beyond few millimeters there is absolutely no dose so this seems a very attractive as a radiation oncologist 20 years back i and as a student of radiation oncology we were very excited to see this and you know, we were wondering when when can we use this Obviously, when we see no dose, obviously we could eliminate side effects because there is no dose beyond this. You can see the orange thing ends here. Unlike X-rays, which kind of radiate some portion of the tumor, some portion of the body. So potentially it could cause less toxicity. You could give, give a higher doses without causing toxicity, thereby leading to better tumor control. We could reduce the incidence of second malignancies. You know that radiation causes second cancer sometimes, occasionally, in some patients. That could be reduced to safer to give lesser doses or higher doses each, each fraction so that we can, we, we all know that radiation is given over six weeks, seven weeks. But potentially, because we're giving very low doses to normal tissues, we could give very high doses each day and reduce the normal tissue doses. 
we are doing that with x-ray as well but we could do slightly better with protons and because of all this patient convenience higher tumor control less side effects potentially we may improve the quality of life so this was the general idea theoretical benefits of protons so unfortunately proton therapy has been there since many many years many many decades it hasn't seen those kind of advances what photons have seen as far as rapid advances are concerned reason it needs huge infrastructure i'll come to that a bit later but there was a proton and there is a proton and there's a remarkable difference between that proton and this proton and unfortunately everyone puts every proton in the same basket this proton is called pencil beam scanning proton beam therapy which is essentially a unique way to deliver so i mentioned about the Bragg peak this is the Bragg peak named after a scientist Bragg william Bragg, and and this deposits you know deposition of dose can be done um, spot by spot layer by layer painting from the deepest layer to the superficial layer and we can see this in a video that you know these are the spots the Bragg peak the dose points where you know the proton beams are being delivered so you can see that entire tumor receives the dose and there is nothing beyond the tumor there is some dose from the skin to the tumor but nothing beyond the tumor so what does that impact you can see another picture that x-rays you could give there could be of course this is not the uniform intensity we see it's incorrect but just to explain to you but essentially protons we can stop within the tumor and there's very little dose beyond but how does it impact the real you know in, in real patient this is a vmat dose for a sacral tumor this is the rectum this is the bladder you are unable to see because it's all covered by some doses to, of radiation. So sacral tumor, the femoral heads, the bladder, rest of the areas, inguinal area also receiving some amount of doses. You see this is protons, this is VMAT, this is something called tomotherapy, both are x-ray based treatments, protons, this is the thing there you can see beautifully spared bladder half of the circumference of the rectum receives literally no doses the femoral heads receive no doses you know beautifully sparing the normal tissues why are we why does the proton stop because proton has a mass has a charge x-rays do not have mass and charge they literally interact with matter and get attenuated but protons actually interact with a medium and then stop because protons stop, we can make them stop within the tumor and we could deliver no dose beyond the tumor. So if, if non-oncologists here are able to understand this, this simple thing, I think my job, I will be successful that protons stop, x-rays do not. And because we can make them stop, we can make them stop within the tumor, right? So for example, this is a child um, Dr. Anika mentioned medulloblastoma, which is a tumor which needs irradiation of brain and spine. And this is the helical tomotherapy, which is a very advanced form of X-ray radiation. But you can see that the child has a dose delivered to the oral cavity, to the thyroid, to the heart, to the lungs, to the bowel, to the kidneys, to gonads, etc., etc. We cannot stop that. But with proton therapy, you can see that beautifully carved doses. You could spare the thyroid, you could spare the oral cavity, and whatever all the organs which I mentioned, including gonads, essentially limiting the doses to the whole body compared to the conventional radiation. Another mediastinal tumor in the chest, this is proton therapy. This is X-ray based technique. You can see low dose going to the entire lung. You could see beautifully sparing of the normal healthy lungs on both sides. And this is proton therapy. And this is intensity modulated radiation therapy. This is for prostate cancers. 
this is for brain tumors you can see simple pictorial which represents that this is the tumor the rest of the brain receives very less doses compared to the conventional radiation therapy so you could have potential impact in almost all cancers pediatric thoracic prostate sarcoma head and neck brain and gi cancers and there are multiple advantages i'll come to that in details and apart from the physical advantage there could be biological advantage as well because x-rays also cause dna damage protons cause dna damage but compared to x-rays the density of the dna damage is much higher with protons compared to x-rays the complexity of damage is greater because because of which the dna repair mechanisms are difficult to be activated and based on this uh, there is a, a, you know understanding that the radiobiological effectiveness is slightly higher about 10 to 15 20 percent higher compared to x-rays of course we compensate that when we prescribe the dose but by so apart from physically being advantageous they are biologically better right because of this there could be you no know, improved and up better outcomes if this is so then why don't we treat every patient with protons why don't we have just why why do we have only one center in india and nowhere else in the rest of the country not in south africa and not in the rest of the african subcontinent the reason is the infrastructure which is required is huge which is massive literally this is a, a, a gantry in one of the rooms in the proton it's three storied big you cannot um, you know build you know you make a building and just bring in the machine you cannot you have to bring the machine and then build a you know make a building around it it's that huge the cyclotron which is literally the the manufacturer of protons from where the protons actually come from is literally 12 feet diameter in diameter so there is a large cyclotron large energy transport beam transportation system huge gantries to bend and to make sure that proton therapy can be pushed into a location which is absolutely precise sub millimeter the gantry weighs 130 tons and despite that there is a pinpoint accuracy it's accurate to sub millimeter levels so to ensure all that there is a lot of infrastructure and a lot of gadgetry in play and therefore this doesn't come uh, cheap unfortunately and that is why healthcare systems across the world cannot invest in, in, in multiple such centers of course the costs are coming down because the footprint is coming down hopefully with the costs coming down the footprints coming down smaller proton therapy centers while i was uh, doing my md 20 year 22 years back i used to hear that for to 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 build a proton center you need a space equivalent to a football field now you don't require that big uh, land anymore but still it's quite huge and that needs to come down for the cost to come down so that this kind of technology can be useful for many patients now this is the beam transportation system it's quite long a lot of shielding requirements a lot of air conditioning coolants many many things are required and that is why we signed a deal with atomic energy regulatory board <clears throat> in 2012 <clears throat> for the site to be approved for the proton therapy the the contract was signed with iba who actually supplied the machine to us in jan 2013 do you know when did we start 2019 jan so it took six years after we signed the contract for us to start the beam and to treat patients and you know this is how and then this is how there is another center which is going to come up in, in India soon in Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, which is my alma mater. It's a publicly funded hospital, so it is going to treat patients uh, for, 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 for the masses. That also signed the contract almost in the same year. They are yet to start, so you can imagine you know, that this kind of delay. So they, they have taken 10 years for the center to be built. We have taken slightly less. 
So because the center needs a huge infrastructure, we cannot say that every patient should be treated with protons. You cannot say that. We have to be responsible in, in, in suggesting it to the patients who would really benefit from it, who would really deserve the, you know, all the travel and have to, they have to make and the costs of everything which needs, it has to be justified. And therefore, um, you know, guidelines across the world are now being more judicious in selecting patients who would really benefit with protons. And this is the American Society of Radiation Oncology kind of not guidelines, I would say, but kind of policies in, in with regard to proton therapy. And they've mentioned that for group one indications where they say that on the basis of medical necessity requirements and published clinical data, disease sites that frequently support the use of proton beam therapy are ocular tumors, chordomas and chondrosarcomas, primary and metastatic tumors of spine where the spinal cord tolerance may be exceeded, hepatocellular cancers where radiation therapy is indicated, primary or benign solid tumors in children, patients with genetic syndromes like NF1 or retinoblastomas, we obviously avoid radiation in them as much as possible. But if we have to irradiate those uh, patients, proton therapy is better. Malignant and benign primary CNS tumors, advanced unresectable head and neck cancers, cancers of paranasal sinuses, non-metastatic retroperitoneal sarcomas, and those patients who require radiation for the second or third time, re-irradiation. Those patients also would benefit with proton beam therapy. This is the level one indications. The level two are those which are more common but the evidence is still emerging so on a case-to-case -case basis they could be considered but not generalized so these are uh, resectable head and neck cancers thoracic malignancies abdominal malignancies pelvic malignancies prostate cancers and breast cancers so there are various hypotheses in terms of what percentage of patients among those who require radiation would benefit with proton therapy in a big way and most people believe that it could range anywhere from five percent to 25 percent but most proton proponents believe that it is between 20 to 25 percent this is our data so far we have treated 900 plus patients in the last four years and the most common group of patients, in fact, four out of five patients belong to this category. One, brain tumors, two, pediatric cancers, three, head, neck and skull based tumors, four, musculoskeletal and bone and soft tissue. So 90% of patients belong to these four categories, brain tumors, pediatric tumors. Pediatric tumors actually consider 25 to 30% of all our, you know, now it's almost 25 although pediatric cancers consume less than one percent of cancers but when it comes to proton therapy uh, one out of four are children so this is uh, one of my publications where we uh, we emphasized about evidence generation in proton therapy it's it's not easy it's it, it's easy to say that we need to use it we may be biased but when should we use it? How should we use it? When is the best time to use it? And we kind of, uh, uh, you know, proposed some of um, the ways to generate evidence in proton beam therapy, and especially pediatric cancers where I treat a lot of children. Um, uh, I'm very passionate about how we make things very congenial to children. We have a children's play area. We make colorful masks for children. We have a, a video to show tour to proton gantry to to humor them to make sure you know make sure that they come to treatment in a very good mood and we can avoid maybe even pediatric sedation in in in, in children above four years four four and a half years and we have a storybook to say how proton is delivered etc cetera, etc cetera, to, to engage with children and their parents See, this is a child whom I've treated in Hyderabad uh, about uh, 2009. So maybe, yeah, 14 years, 13 years back. This is the child and this was my student at that point of time. We treated this child who had a medulloblastoma. 
he she underwent surgery post surgery she was unable to walk that's why uh, my resident is actually carrying the child and the child is um, you know did underwent surgery and then underwent radiation therapy to brain and spine and then underwent chemotherapy and of course the mother is still in touch with me the disease is controlled the good news is that there is no disease and on the scan but the true story is the child is not going to school because she's unable to focus and learn she's unable to walk she has been unable and she's not was not able to walk since surgery she has been on continuous neuro rehabilitation but still unable to walk the growth is stunted there are multiple endocrinopathies she's on supplements she has skin changes hair changes she has another sister who has a long hair she doesn't so clearly there are uh, you know clearly we can say that probably there are skin changes and hair changes she has frequent infections she's obese there are major psychological issues her mortal enemy is her sister why because sister can do everything she cannot sister can go to school sister has friends sister has long hair sister can run and play and she can not do any of those stuff so very sobering story for her. i'm not saying that this is very common but this is unfortunate that we are curing children but we are also giving them a ton of late effects which not just are contributed by radiation therapy they are contributed by surgery chemotherapy radiation therapy and so on and, and multiple medications and this is data from saint jude's life study which essentially shows there are multiple uh, you know uh, um, late effects you know, second cancers cardiovascular renal hematological after 30 40 50 years you now when they they become 30 40 50 these are childhood cancer survivors and now that we are seeing better and better survivorship in, the, in these children it is important for us to give a good survivorship that means quality of survival right so these are not just for brain tumors for bone tumors soft tissue sarcomas wilms tumors neuroblastomas so all of these have a significant burden of late effects and one of those ways uh, one of the culprits is radiation therapy and the good thing is almost all late effects are dose dependent that means you give higher the dose higher doses to normal tissues there are more late effects and proton therapy what i've said is that it can reduce the doses to normal tissues therefore late effects could be less it's a no-brainer late effects do not appear in tissues or organs that are not irradiated and I showed you that with protons, there is no low doses, there is no dose. There is no dose to many adjacent organs, not in all situations, but in some situations and good number of situations. So if you see these kind of pictures, proton therapy is definitely beneficial. This is another uh, uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. You see that you know the amount of radiation given to the external genitalia and the labia the vagina and the inguinal region you can see that you know we can beautifully spare all the external genitalia and a young child and potentially tell parents that she could have a normal sexual function potentially so summary of benefits in children are reduction in neurocognitive decline better neuroendocrine preservation lesser organ dysfunction such as bone marrow heart lungs salivary glands bowel kidneys doses to uterus etc preservation of fertility sparing of gonads lesser probability of second cancers and apart from all these we have published from our group that the quality of life also could be better in less than four years so younger the child we generally avoid radiation as much as possible but in less than four years also we could irradiate so this is our publication on the preliminary experience of treating about 50 children we published in the year 2021 this is published in journal of clinical oncology global oncology and uh, we presented that these are our
patients, pediatric gliomas, medulloblastomas, ependymomas were the most common tumors. We also treated extracranial rhabdomyosarcoma, um, germ, I know, cranial rival chordomas, chondrosarcomas, and all those intracranial tumors as well, germ cell tumors, craniopharyngiomas, etc. We also have uh, published our outcomes with craniospinal radiation, which is one of the first uh, such reports uh, uh, about um, 40 odd patients. We also have published our, you know, on clinical oncology, um, the audits, we did internal audit on craniospinal radiation. And we, we showed that how, um, you know, this can be used for comparing outcomes between institutions. Coming to CNS tumors, uh, I think um, um, uh, Dr. Anika showed beautifully the, uh, the, the range of brain tumors, and we have treated almost all of them, Dr. Anika. You know, we have treated all the pediatric ones, all the adult ones, and CNS is the major chunk of tumors whom we treat patients in with proton beam therapy. This is a unique patient, uh, very unusual. That's why I thought I'll point it. This is a 33 year old gentleman who had acute promyelocytic leukemia, right? AML-M3 underwent uh, a lot of treatment, um, relapsed, underwent allogenic stem cell transplant at Fred Hutchison in Seattle, uh, had unfortunately recurrence in the brain and spine, isolated CNS recurrence with leptomeningeal deposits, which you showed. Uh, after several rounds of discussion, we decided to go ahead with craniospinal radiation and and we had done this for an adult and you know this who was kind of bedridden was had a dramatic response and actually walked back home uh, when he finished the treatment this is the bell of cure which patients uh, kind of ring the bell after they finish the treatments intracranial germ cell tumors both germinomas and non-germinomatous germ cell tumors also have been one of the key indications with proton beam therapy because they need large volume irradiations. For germinomas, we use something called whole ventricular radiation therapy. And for non-seminomatous germ cell tumors, we need craniospinal irradiation. So both sets of tumors require large fields of irradiation. And when we see, whenever we say large fields of irradiation, the proton therapy has a major role. Ependymomas, I think I am very passionate about ependymomas. All ependymomas treated at our hospital are all molecularly classified, whether they are posterior fossa or supratentorial. Erstwhile Rayla fusions used to be done. Now we are doing Zafta fusions. For, in, for infratentorial, the posterior fossa, we do PFAs and PFBs based on 1P, uh, 1Q uh, gain and all that. And we, we treat children based on molecularly subclassified uh, uh, look, molecular classification and the outcomes are extremely encouraging. Difficult location, pediatric low-grade uh, glioma. This is a pilocytic astrocytoma. You mentioned that radiation therapy is rarely indicated. Unfortunately, whenever indicated, proton therapy is a classical. You know, one, one of such cases was brainstem. It was a brainstem medullary uh, 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 low-grade glioma, pilocytic, and this we treated, uh, and he's actually doing well. The, the gentleman in the video is actually him. Uh, similarly, there is a now a randomized trial which is underway between IMPT versus proton therapy versus conventional radiation therapy for low-grade molecularly favorable gliomas, IDH mutated, 1P19Q co-deleted and DERT positive patients are being randomized in an NRG study. Another uh, NRG study for, um, for glioblastomas as well between IMRT and proton beam therapy is underway. Prostate cancers, I, I saw that 25% of cancers in, in South Africa were prostate, so I added a few slides here. Of course, uh, one of the top indications in the United States for many years was prostate cancers. But it is kind of an abuse treatment. I, I wouldn't say that all prostate cancer should be treated with protons because it can be really very well treated with conventional radiation therapy techniques. But there are certain indications where proton therapy could be much beneficial, could be 
patients where we treat pelvic lymph nodes. There is an Indian randomized trial, POP-RT trial, which I was also part of, which Tata Memorial uh, Hospital pioneered. It's called POP-RT. It was a randomized trial between when we treat high-risk prostate cancers. It was randomized between the prostate-only radiation versus prostate and pelvic radiation. When we treated pelvic lymph nodes, the outcomes were better than treating only prostate. Okay, and when we treat the lymph nodes, the toxicity is a little bit higher and considerably higher in certain patients. And that toxicity can be significantly brought down with proton therapy. So when we treat lymph nodes, you see a significant amount of spillage of dose compared to protons where you could actually spare the normal tissues much better. This is one of my publications, which was published in Indian Journal of Particle Beam Therapy. What we did was we estimated late toxicities between proton and IMRT based on NTCP models, validated models for high risk prostate cancers who require pelvic nodal radiation. The red ones are the doses achieved by rectum with protons and blue are the doses achieved with IMRT and you can see there is a remarkable reduction in the doses to the rectum, remarkable reduction in the dose of bladder and we saw that there is a cumulative reduction in the normal tissue complication probability in GI as well as GU toxicities in terms of these six domains incontinence fecal incontinence that is stool leaks bleeding stool frequency hematuria dysuria there was significant reduction there is now long-term data in prostate cancer for almost all sites uh, and the toxicity is quite low with protons the efficacy is quite good comparable with conventional probably even more seen in indirect comparisons but more importantly patients with poor baseline urinary function benefit more with protons um, patients who are young there is data prospective data which says that the erectile function can be better preserved with protons uh, there is no randomized evidence so far. This is all prospective studies and NCCN guidelines also mention that proton therapy can be used as an alternative in prostate cancer. We are treating all patients of prostate cancer as a part of study, prospective registry trial. It's called ProCube. Um, we use definitive radiation therapy, postoperative radiation therapy, oligometastatic disease. All of them is like a basket registry. And the primary endpoint of this study is a patient reported outcome, PR25, which is a patient reported outcome instrument. So we reserve proton therapy for prostate cancer for those patients who are expected to have higher toxicity and those high risk cancers when proton therapy could be even more, could be more beneficial where the outcomes are low. So younger patients, patients with multiple comorbidities, patients with ulcerative colitis, patients with variant anatomies, patients with poor baseline urinary scores, high and very high risk where pelvic nodal radiation is required, post-op cancers and patients considered for dose escalation. I think the one which I clearly have uh, not mentioned is those rare patients who require re-irradiation. Musculoskeletal tumors, I'm very passionate and I think there is a clear cut advantage of proton therapy. We have treated chordomas, we have treated chondrosarcomas, Ewing spinet, osteosarcomas, soft tissue sarcomas and plasma cytomas. This is another registry which is un being, uh, uh, we are accruing patients to this registry called SCORE, sarcoma, chordoma and chondrosarcoma, prospective registry. And we use the, you know, all the MRIs, which uh, Dr. Enneker mentioned regarding the DCE MRI, which is uh, perfusion uh, MRI, when we, we see the perfusion maps in these patients. This is one of our early patients, large tumor, sacral chordoma. You can see how huge it is. Uh, we treated him in the August, I um, mean, we finished the treatment in, 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 in month of, I think, April or May. This is the baseline scan and this is the August 1st three monthly scan and this is the January 2020 scan. This is the DCE MRI with, with the perfusion uh, maps. You can see that there is no perfusion within the tumor 
and the tumor actually was, although size is reduced, but there is no perfusion. Uh, we continued to observe this patient, Jan 2022. You know, you can see the tumor has shrunken quite a bit, able to walk with the limb, occasional analgesics. He was always constipated, but the bladder is functional. So I think very reasonably good outcome so far in this patient after three years. Thoracic cancers, uh, just to illustrate to you, this is a 63-year-old gentleman of squamous cell carcinoma of left lung, N3 because of the contralateral hilar lymph node. Diabetic hypertensive was weighing 120 kgs and he was on intermittent oxygen and this is the tumor on PET scan. These are challenging tumors with IMRT, the standard of care in these patients is giving radiation and chemotherapy together but it's almost impossible to give them because the, the normal tissue doses were very, very high. So the patient received chemotherapy first, followed by radiation. And then after initial chemotherapy had some partial response, not much of benefit. So they gave proton therapy with radiation because you see that the dose to the heart came down from 30 gray to seven gray to the lung, mean dose from almost 20 gray to 12 gray 36 percent volume receiving 20 gray to 22 percent so significantly better plan in a in a such a vulnerable patient who could have much higher toxicities could complete the treatment with the probability of a very low grade 3 toxicity in fact the patient is doing very well i met him a week back in mumbai um, had received one year of immunotherapy as well and is almost asymptomatic, completely off oxygen, is able to move around, etc. This is the first randomized trial uh, published in Journal of Clinical Oncology. Um, a very good editorial written by Chuck Simon from New York Proton Therapy Center. This randomized trial showed that the toxicity burden could be better, could be lesser with proton therapy for esophageal cancers. And this toxicity burden could be uh, cumulative cardiac toxicities, cumulative pulmonary toxicities, post-operative complications, anastomotic leaks, etc. We've also treated mediastinal lymphomas. Um, these are uh, complex tumors, although they require less doses, but they are complex and we need to reduce the integral doses, that means doses to normal body. And we were able to manage that with protons. Thymoma as well mesothelioma, difficult tumors, thoracic sarcomas. Um, head and neck cancers are also one of the common indications. The top four indications of head and neck are oral cavity cancers, skull base and PNS cancers, salivary gland tumors, and re-radiation. I think these two, there is no controversy. In fact, patients come from all over the world. In fact, you know, in this Indian subcontinent, from Middle East, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from Singapore, from Australia, because there are no proton centers, patients of salivary gland tumors, patients of paranasal sinuses do come travel to India and take treatment with heart proton therapy center. There is a, a, a meta-analysis between a, a radiation therapy and proton beam therapy for paranasal sinus tumors, and there is distinct advantage with the use of proton beam therapy in terms of improvement in survival. GI cancers, uh, you know, this is uh, again um, emerging indication with protons. Not all GI cancers can be treated with protons. They are extremely complex because they are moving continuously. But we have treated liver cancers, which I mentioned that it is a group one indication. Pancreatic cancers as well have been selectively treated with protons. So, essentially, to end my talk, this is one of the publications which we present with published recently. India is a low and middle income country, although there are many, many rich people in India, but India is still considered low and middle income. South Africa is also a low and middle income country, if I'm not wrong, or a middle income country probably. And one wonders, proton therapy is such an expensive technology and used in such a small group of indications. So is it really justified? And we, we try to argue our thoughts. This is again published in Journal of Clinical Oncology, Global Oncology. And of course, we, I know any of you who's interested can, I know I can share the paper with you. 
But what we wrote is PBT is an engineering marvel, which is of certainly of great benefit for a few, incremental benefit for some, and probably of very little benefit or no benefit for a, a large group of patients. But those who are likely to benefit with this technology, irrespective of their country of residence, must be able to access this technology at a reasonable cost. And one cannot say that I will only make sure that proton therapy will come only when everyone is fed or all the poverty is alleviated or we solve all other problems. We cannot say that. I always say this, we cannot say we will not build roads unless everyone is fed. We have to feed everyone, we have to build roads, we have to go to the Mars if you now India has a Mars mission and India has probably the lowest low cost Mars mission which is successful. So all three have to be happening parallelly. We cannot say that this can happen only then we'll do this. So access versus timely adoption of modern technology should be parallel goals, not complementary goals. And I think to bring access for patients in South Africa, at least some of them, you could consider, you know, referring your patients to India, those who are motivated, those who understand the benefits, those who uh, wish to come to India, could benefit with this technology in a significant way, could be referred uh, appropriately, not just in India, there are now centers in the United Kingdom, there are centers in Europe, there are other centers in the rest of the world. And when you see a child, when you see a brain tumor kid, and when you see a specific tumors, which could benefit in a big way. I think as, as physicians, we'll have to tell them that there is a technology which could do a better job. Maybe expensive, maybe they have to travel, but we can make uh, their lives better with uh, uh, an improved and better treatment. And that needs to be uh, made aware to the patients. And that is why I'm here today to, to tell my colleagues in South Africa that there is a, another technology which could benefit a group of patients um, in a big way. So to conclude, we have treated about more than 900 patients. We have a promising preliminary experience. We have treated multiple sites and data is being collected prospectively in multiple prospective registries. Uh, so far, there have been low rates of acute toxicities. Uh, we, although we have treated large percentage of patients, a recurrent cancers, re-radiation, although we don't like to treat them, but we do get a lot of patients who require re-radiation. As footprint comes down, as I mentioned, the cost is likely to come down. And there are several randomized controls, control trials ongoing, not in India as such, but in, in, in the world, there are, there are randomized trials for GBM, local glymas, esophageal cancers, liver cancers, breast cancers, prostate cancers, head neck cancers, these are, there are at least eight or nine randomized trials which are ongoing in, in, in parts of the world, which hopefully will refine the indications in the future. But as of now, we know the major indications, and I think those are, you know, those I have already mentioned to all of you. Uh, with this, I would like to be, uh, would like to say thank you to all of you, and I'm grateful for, uh, for the audience for coming, sparing their valuable time. Uh, today. Thank you so much. I will be happy to answer any questions, uh, although uh, the chairman of SAMA would like to moderate it. Yes.
Uh, good evening, colleagues. Um, if you could please maybe join in giving another round of applause to Dr. Chilikuri and Dr. Enika. I think both. I thought both presentations were highly insightful and uh, would have made for the time that you've taken from other things that you could have been doing tonight to be with us here uh, today. Um, I know that you've started with the questions, but just some thoughts um, you know, that came to my mind as I was listening to the presentations. Um, let's thank Dr. Chilikur. I think it was a very balanced presentation in terms of the benefits and where there were questions to be asked. Uh, he highlighted those. And um, I think um, we all learned a great deal about the proton beam therapy you know, from the presentation tonight. And I was particularly interested that there was some um, focus given to uh, the cancers that are a problem in South Africa. Dr. Enika took us through a journey through the CNS tumors. And uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, for those of us that don't really work in that area, you might have forgotten from medical school how many of these tumors there are and how many of them you know, are quite deadly and how difficult it is to treat them you know, many a times. But what was comforting is that in the same breath, Dr. Chiluk Kuri indicated that uh, you know, for most of them, you know, the tumors that we're talking about and that Dr. Enika talked you know, to us about would probably be amenable you know, to the proton beam therapy. So my hope then is that as we go forward, um, as the footprint of the proton beam you know, modality uh, increases, we would get a situation where the cost is coming down because ideally what we'd like to see going forward is this treatment modality being accessible to everybody, not only those that can afford, but for the person in the street to be able to get access to this kind of um, you know, treatment. And I think the thoughts that you raised towards the end of the session are critical. And I think that's exactly what colleagues will be asking themselves about. You know, you bring these here, but how many people will benefit? But I think it was a very balanced you know, um, you know, presentation as it were. And um, Dr. Enika, we really do appreciate the work that you guys are doing um, you know, at uh, King and um, Albert Lichin you know, Tishari in the center as well. Um, I know that you had the first question. If I could maybe, as you introduce, please introduce yourself very briefly and then the question, please. Okay, hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Nirvada Singh, Public Health Specialist. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Enika. I think I was taken back to my fourth year medicine <laughs> and, <laughs> and just a refresh on categorizing tumors. I did take a snapshot and I'm going to go through it again at home. <laughs> um, to um, Dr. Chilukuri, thank you for such, uh, um, I would say, highly innovative and ac academic presentation. Uh, a lot of quantum physics thrown in, which is very important. Um, two questions from me. The first one of which is, from a public health approach in terms of health and safety, what are the personal protective equipment required for your doctors to wear? Is it very similar to a lead apron, which the radiographers have to wear or the surgeons have to wear in theater? And um, yeah, so, you know, in an X-ray room, everything has to be leaded. So in terms of proton beam therapy, what sort of um, health and safety are we looking at? 
That's my first question. My second question is, do you see proton beam therapy um, in the in intervention of uh, hemorrhagic infarcts in neurosurgery someday to actually decrease its size without going in invasively? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments, uh, if I may. So um, the first question was regarding the proton therapy safety requirements and uh, personal monitoring devices. You're absolutely right that it needs an intensive, uh, just like an X-ray unit or, or a linear, linear accelerator, which uses high energy X-rays. But protons, because they have much higher energy, the shielding requirements are uh, literally five, six times. That means if you have a four, me four meter concrete wall, you need 15, 20 meter concrete wall for the shielding. But there are multiple devices because there are some neutron which also comes into play there are some neutron monitors so there is an array of monitors which needs to be present all around the campus to make sure that the amount of radiation received the background radiation received is within the tolerance we all wear something called personal uh, radiation monitors uh, which needs to be worn so that every month the um, every quarter rather, rather every quarter each person's exposure to radiation different kinds of radiation including the neutron badge uh, will tell us you know whether we should be working continuously working there but the fact is that the modern x-ray machines have become so more advanced that we don't need the lead apron anymore as far as the the therapeutic treatment is concerned. I'm not talking about x-ray unit where some sometime a non-cooperative patient or a child of parent, you have to wear a lead apron to make sure that the diagnostic procedure is done. But for x-ray therapeutic procedures or put on therapeutic procedures, we are not inside the room. There is no way uh, a, who is not, a person who is not a patient can be within the room. No way. If the child is uncooperative, we sedate the child. The parents stay outside, parents are my, sometimes they talk to the child while the treatment is ongoing and the child is not sedated. But every person who is not the patient has to remain outside the room. This is not just for protons, it is also for conventional x-ray based radiation therapy techniques. And then array of personal monitors, once the treatment is off, the Dugnis treatment is done, you go into the room, there is negligible exposure, there is almost no exposure including for those who do that day in and day out. So it is quite safe. Essentially, it's quite safe. The second question uh, is uh, regarding hemorrhagic infarcts. Um, by and large, I am, I am totally against radiation for any non-cancerous, non-tumorous conditions. Because radiation has got many good effects, but many bad effects too. And I generally don't recommend radiation for any of those uh, benign conditions where we can avoid radiation for a child, for definitely sure, but even for adults. So I don't see radiation coming as an option for hemorrhagic infarcts. Although radiation is now being used for many non-cancerous conditions such as cardiac ablation. So a patient who has arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias, refractory resistant cardiac arrhythmias, are being treated with radiation therapy, not with protons, but with radiation therapy to ablate the node, which is essentially sending the uh, cardiac uh, signal uh, for, for contractility. And that could reverse certain arrhythmia. So there is a paper in New England Journal of Medicine a few years back. So, um, so a lot of excitement. I'm one of those old school radiation oncologists who like to avoid radiation wherever it's not required. But I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but hemorrhaging infarcts, I, I don't want to. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, evening, Dr. Uh, Chilugur and everyone. Uh, my name is Tevo Hovaloy. I'm a medical physicist from Richards Bay Medical Institute. Uh, 
My first question is based on the machine itself. Do, do you have any beam modifiers on, on, on the Proton Air? So we do not yeah. have beam modifiers because it's a pencil beam scanning system. It's a pencil beam, so it's not a broad beam. Uh, no. Uh, and beyond the, the Bragg peak itself is defined by the proton range, the range of protons in a tissue or any object. So the Bragg peak itself, it has a certain width. So how do you modify this width to ensure that it conforms to the size and shape of your tumor? Fantastic. So what we do is we use differential proton energies. The proton energies which are available to us are between 70, 70, 70 million electron volts to 226 million electron volts. 70 million electron volt proton beam has a Bragg peak at 4 centimeter below the skin. Okay and 226 million electron volt proton beam has a Bragg peak at 36 centimeters beneath, below the skin. So if the tumor has a depth, say from the skin of between 12 to 20 centimeters, that tumor will be treated in different layers. Each layer will have different energies. The deepest layer will have higher beam energy and more superficial layer will have lower proton beam energy. I didn't know that a physicist would be in the audience, otherwise I would have been a little more elaborate on my presentation. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Shukuri and Dr. Hanak. It's an excellent, excellent presentation, though I'm not a radiologist or an oncologist. I'm basically pediatrics. Uh, I heard both of you mentioned robotic surgery. Does India do robotic surgery in public sector or only private sector? And same question go for uh, South Africa. Should we, uh, do we have a robotic surgery in public sector? And the other question is uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or the tumor surgery in South Africa, it, especially Albert Dutuli. What is the turnaround time, waiting time, and uh, all these chemotherapy available country wise? And for Dr. Chukari, I'm still interested the cost of proton therapy. We had a patient a few years ago, he's a doctor retroperitoneal carcinoma. He went to Chennai and he did he did very well and came back. So those are my concerns. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so <laughs> with me you understand um, I'm a medical doctor but I'm also from a management background so I'm currently CEO and medical manager. So I, I tend to look at the system of things. Um, I'm, I'm really interested um, in when, when you were breaking down the, the, you know, the, the favorable options, how you guys have chosen to rationalize um, your accessibility. I, I, I saw that you looked at the clinical just diagnosis, but all in all, price on human life, we all accept that what would you say then become the realities of having to come and say look this is ideally who you would have to turn away to make it worthwhile for who you decide to invest in because i'm interested in those other factors that determine what type of patient would actually benefit given the cost of this so for me i, I really wanted to to understand how you guys what the other factors are um I'm also interested, you know, funding is a huge issue. Um, we obviously are coming from South Africa where we've got a health system that is still very much dominated by the public sector. We are trying to get ourselves ready for NHI. You've got the Western Cape that is trying to lead that hybrid model between public and private. How then, I'm, I'm very interested in 
how did this brainchild come about in terms of the funding model that then allows accessibility of this kind of treatment to the general population because understanding the economics we know that it's not so how do you guys bridge that health model or what was the, the structure that you guys chose to put in place that then allowed this to be possible and still make it accessible i think i'm interested in that looking at where we're trying to go within any time I mean, yeah. Yes, sure. Uh, with, with to robot, robotic surgery, I don't think there's any in neurosurgery any robotic surgery happening in any of the And in terms of the uh, turnaround time for cancer patients, it, it, it varies depending on the tumor that the patient has because, uh, and, the, and the status of the patient because these tumors in the brain tend to affect level of consciousness, the type of tumor because the pituitary adenoma versus the glioblastoma malignant tumor, that malignant tumor will take more priority. And then there's other factors at play such as the histology as well. But I'll say that the turnaround time is very good to try and get patients done within two weeks from admissions. Uh, 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 and then we get the histology and we get them to oncologist. I think the oncologist can comment on the turnaround time of the But I mean, I think the turnaround times are very good for neurosurgery and the patient going to us. Maybe oncologists can answer that question in South Africa. Evening, I'm Dr. Mbala from Radiation Oncology, um, the neuro oncology side. Um, so we have our NDT two times a month. Um, patients don't generally wait more than two weeks for an appointment. When we see our patients, so our NDTs are on Tuesdays and we scan patients on Wednesday. So literally you can be seen today, um, scanned tomorrow or the following week. And um, from scan to treatment, um, less than three weeks. So that's actually quite good, especially in the state sector. Um, we have our, we use modern um, radiotherapy, which is the standard of care. Um, we've got IMRT and Linux, and we've got stereo. Um, and so we're privileged actually at Alpha too, because um, not all centers in South Africa can offer stereo. Um, with regards to chemo, we've got access to most of the chemo drugs. Um, where we have a shortfall, we don't have access to targeted agents in the public sectors, but basically all chemotherapies in the um, public sectors that are indicated, we do have access to. So, so I think uh, we are pretty much comparable to what uh, you've mentioned now in public sector, for sure, private sector, sky is the limit, nothing is, of course, I'm sure in South Africa too. Um, in public health system, there are a few hospitals which are uh, uh, kind of like Tata Memorial where and my, my, my alma mater, which is a public funded hospital, it's, uh, it's almost the treatments are free of cost. Uh, the waiting lists are slightly definitely more than what you mentioned, three weeks, uh, which is almost impossible to achieve and because we, Tata Hospital sees 70,000 new cancer patients a year, 70,000, so hard, large number. So. Um, but yeah, access to immunotherapy, targeted therapy is limited in public hospitals. Um, the turnaround times are a bit longer, definitely. Robotic surgeries are done in many public hospitals in India now. Um, so in Chennai, there is a public hospital where it is being done. In Mumbai, there are there are a few. So there are many public hospitals where robotic surgery is done. The question which I'm very excited to answer is, you know, very interesting two questions. Um, one was regarding, um, first question I forgot. <laughs> Can you repeat? Remind us that Sorry? Uh... Yeah, rationalization. It, that's, that's the most complicated thing. I don't know how do we do it. I, I can't say for sure how do we do it because every I mean, like, the, you know, you mentioned we have MDTs every day and we personalize. I, I don't think there is, you know, one single answer where we can say that, okay, these patients definitely benefit, these patients, no. There could be many pediatric cancers who would benefit, but there are many children who would not greatly benefit. 
say depending on the location, the tumor, the dose, many, many factors, we would say it's not worth it. Let's not try for protons. So rationalizing is, is very difficult. I generalized some of the indications here, but you cannot really generalize. Even for a child, we always recommend, suggest to all referring oncologists or referring physicians and to prospective patients and their families to send us the, the, all the details first, to have a talk with us, to have a discussion with us before they actually you know, travel to Chennai. Because we could say no to them after they come all the way to Chennai, which is, which is absolute shame. So we encourage that to make sure that we really call the deserving patients. So we had one patient from South Africa just recently. The gentleman had a backache for almost a year. So some kind of a low grade lesion and underwent, uh, unfortunately this happens in India too, uh, open biopsy uh, of a sarcoma, which should not be done. It happens in India too, but it happened. So it can potentially contaminates the whole area, right? So there is a higher chance of dissemination. And it turned out to be sclerosing epithelioid fibrosarcoma, SEF. There is specific mutation. I treat a lot of sarcomas. So this gentleman was uh, told appropriately at the government center at Cape Town that you need, they need to, he needs to undergo an end block resection, which is extremely impossible because it was involving the interspinous, uh, 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 you know, interspinous region with paraspinal extension, very closely abutting the cord. And the sarcoma surgeon in Cape Town saw and said end block resection is not possible. Then was he was mentioned that proton therapy could be an option. He explored it. He found out on the internet that we were doing for sarcomas. And this gentleman came. When we, he, we saw the reports initially, we said, no, surgery should be done. Forget about protons. Let's do surgery first and then we'll see protons. But he said, okay, if surgery is possible, I'm happy to travel. Then he came and we saw and finally we realized Surgeon Cape Town was right. Surgery was very, very difficult, risky, and block resection in the paraspinal location was not possible, and therefore we started protons. So he's currently ongoing proton therapy. He's one of the first. Another child whom received uh, rhabdomyosarcoma, parameningeal rhabdomyosarcoma from South Africa, a uh, three-year-old child, um, and, and with a young baby brother, which is three months old. He's not a patient, he's just uh, accompanying family member, uh, but uh, we are treating these two patients from South Africa right now. So it's difficult to rationalize which patients should be treated. Uh, we individualize the decision. We do it in an MDT uh, framework as much as possible. And, and the last question, which is even more tougher to answer is, fortunately, India is going to have another proton therapy center in a public health space. Uh, which is fully funded by taxpayers because India, such a large population, 1.3 billion, needs more than one proton center. In fact, in my paper, which I published, we showed that India needed at least five or six proton centers, which can treat approximately about 6,000 to 10,000 patients. Because we have medulloblastomas, we have ependymomas, we have children who, are, who need, we have chordomas, we have these spinal sarcomas. Where will they get treatment? All of them cannot travel to United States. They need to be treated in India. So we are talking to state governments, which are sponsoring certain indications after a thorough review of the case that yes, this patient really deserves protons. Then they reimburse that whole amount. So currently the cost ranges between somebody asked the cost of Hussein. So it ranges somewhere between 15,000 to 60,000 US dollars. Depends on how many fractions need sedation, image guidance, etc., etc. But some patients are treated at $15,000, some are $60,000. There are many, many, uh, uh, you know, number of fractions and many, many things. How do we also decide is also there's a social worker in the MDT. He will also assess the patient. We will say, okay, it's not worth it. The patient will not be able to raise funds. Another thing is if the patient is really deserving, whether it's a domestic or international patient, 
We are looking to raise funds through foundation. We have Apollo Cancer Foundation, which is helping children, mainly children. There are crowdfunding agencies. There are NGOs. We have treated eight children from Mauritius, free of cost, almost free of cost, through entire funding through some NGOs who are working with uh, patients from Mauritius, because that NGO is Mauritian government based or Mauritian based. So the, such similar uh, uh, you know, support is being organized you now that is also there is an active crowdfunding agency, uh, which is also helping patients to raise funds. Hospital is also providing some discount. So for hospital always says that for a deserving patients cost is not a barrier. It's easier said than done for them as well as for us, but at least they say it and they do it, though they do you know, extend help to the maximum extent in most patients. So this is how we manage. Uh, but there are, of course, many patients where we say, yes, you probably will get this much benefit, but it's okay if you take conventional radiation. Please go ahead and take the treatment locally. We don't encourage them to come here because why should they come all the way to Chennai? So this is how we, we manage. Thank you. Um, well, I'm a physician. I'm, I'm, I cannot answer that question, but uh, um, I mean, Apollo is, 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 is worldwide and it has I can I don't know whether I can say this openly it has got deep pockets so so they can they can potentially do it if they see a, a merit in it a business case in it yes doctor um, we've spoken about the cost to the patient but how much is setting up such a unit cost how much like I don't know in, in Indian currency it's about 1100 1100 crores which is uh, any math genius in the crowd can tell me 1,100 crore Indian rupees. You want to tell, you want me to tell in US dollars? Yeah, US dollars, please. So maybe 60 million US dollars? Not bad, right? Let's invest one, one in South Africa. <laughs> is that for like the machine, the bunker? Everything? The machine, the bunker, exactly. Only the machine and bunker. Okay, not the building. Not the, not the whole thing because every year you can buy a too low end Linux with the maintenance cost. I hope you understand. You know, we have an annual maintenance, right? CMC, comprehensive maintenance every year, which we pay for the, for the Varian or Electra. With the maintenance we pay for IBA, the vendor who supplied, we can buy two Linux. It is that much expensive. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for um, very insightful questions. Um, so before you go, maybe just one last question on the clinical side as we close uh, the meeting. Uh, when you were talking about the prostate cancer, I didn't hear you say anything about the Gleason score. What role does it play so, in terms of assessing you know, in the workup? You know, yes, uh, so benefits? absolutely. High risk cancers, that means Gleason 8 and above, 8, 9 and 10. Node positive cancers, node negative but higher Gleasons because of which there are a higher chance of microscopic nodal disease positive patients potentially could benefit with protons. Younger patients would benefit with protons. Patients with poor baseline urinary function could benefit with protons. Patients who are on anticoagulants and multiple medications, comorbidities could benefit with protons. So these are some of those, uh, you know, ultra selected patients who would really benefit with protons. Thank you very much. Colleagues, um, thank you. Thank you so much for having been a good audience throughout uh, the evening. Uh, what then remains for me at this point is to thank each and every one of you who has been here today. I'd like to recognize the board members from the SA Medical Association that are here and maybe those that are online as well. I'd like to thank the leadership of Apollo um, you know, for the colleagues that are here and also maybe those that could be watching online. 
Um, as an association, we are pleased to col collaborate with the Apollo Cancer Care Therapy. Um, we do think that this will start a debate um, on the breast milk cancer therapy that we're currently discussing at tonight. And I know that for some colleagues, it would enhance the debate um, you know, that has actually been taking place already. So if we look at our symposium tonight, uh, we discussed the current cancer therapy programs in South Africa. And uh, thank you very much, I think, for the questions that probed even deeper into that question. But what we're looking forward to is that these debates will lead to a situation where we start to look at cancers holistically. You know, how do we you know, aid early, I mean, early detection? How do we move um, you know, most of these cancers to be early detected at the primary health care center? But eventually, I think what we'd like to have is to move then from this uh, generic medicine to personalized molecular oncology. Um, and I think this is the question that always gets raised in you know, middle income countries. Why are you looking at that when you still have And I would share the sentiment that you know, these are not this or the other. We probably need to do these things. I mean, if you look at cancer, um, the numbers are increasing across the board. So you can't say you're not going to invest in modalities you know, that would benefit you know, the population as a whole. So for our members that are here in the room and those that would be you know, watching online, um, I anticipate that there would be a need to revisit the need to treat their patients, cancer patients in particular, with this breakthrough in the technology. First and foremost, you know, um, academically, that's what has been presented. People would want to go and read a bit more and then see how that might apply to their work environment you know, as it were. We are hoping that, um, you know, with these kinds of uh, debates, it will open up possibilities for technologies, you know, that are already out there, you know, is there a possibility that we bring these to South Africa so that we do not have a situation where uh, people have to travel. And again, it then you know, tends to be inequitable because you know, for the patient that is somewhere in talking about definitely will be able to afford you know, that treatment. Um, it, it is um, my pleasure then to say that um, we are happy with the conversation that we had with the paper, and I think some of the questions already were moving in that direction, we did consider, and I think those are some of the things that we need to be talking about you know, sometime in the later stages. But what we wanted to do today is to give colleagues an opportunity to engage talk about the modality, cost, benefits, and how this can actually you know, improve uh, for the cancer, I mean, cancer treatment of our patients. And I think what really uh, matters to each and every one of us sitting in this room as doctors is the benefit to the patient. And I think and that came very clear in the presentations that you and Dr. Anika have presented. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for having been a great sport as sitting here tonight and engaging as actively as it did, but also then to thank you both for having taken the time to put this presentation there for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Monday, do we have the... Sorry? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Unless colleagues maybe 